Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, show 208, recorded at River Road Studios in Eugene, Oregon. Today's show is made possible by the support of the Herbal Nerd Society. If you'd like to help us in doing our podcast and the, the Practical Herbalist, go to the Practical Herbalist and hit the Join tab on the upper uh, left part of the menu and follow the directions through there. Uh, they make it, the Herbal Nerd Society makes it possible for us to do what we do. Now on with the show. Herbal activists and preppers alike will tell you, knowledge of the plant world is powerful. No matter where you call home, you can be sure there are at least five practical and powerful plants you should know. Today we're talking with Jimmy Betts, herbal activist and adventurer, solidarity and disaster medicine specialist, about the best herbs to know and how to find them. Now here are your hosts, Candace Hunter and Sue Sierra Lupe. I'm Candace Hunter. And I'm C.C. Sierra Lupe. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Welcome back, Jimmy. Yes. Thanks for having me back. Welcome back. So I think people may not have heard your first show. They didn't. They're at the Jimmy Betts. Who Who's in that God's guy? name is this guy? Who's that well, guy? But a, you know, the introduction was fabulous. I have yes. to say, well, well written there, Candace. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Gee, but thank people you. might not know what a solidarity and disaster medicine specialist is. Yes. How do you get that job title? Do tell. Mm, I think if it were a job, you'd get paid for it. So I don't know if it's my job. <laughs> um, but I guess that that title just generally comes more into play in incidences of uh, could be considered natural disaster or could be very much uh, human created, human precipitated disasters as well um, that may require some additional effort and support. Uh, to the communities uh, most impacted by those disaster moments. Um, and some of that is, uh, in my in my case, it's related to who I already know that's been living there. And so we know that something is probably going to happen in the future. And in some cases, it's something where a big disaster moment comes up and there's a larger call to action to pretty much anyone who is available with skills to offer, uh, resources to offer. And uh, in the case of most of my involvement, it's been anything from sort of initial response uh, for traumatic injuries. Um, Could be something related to both sort of allopathic oriented trauma care as well as herbal assisted trauma care. Um, And it just varies from place to place considerably. Uh, And in some, some cases, I don't even do the medical portion. It would be something more um, direct assistance oriented too. So that's why it's not specifically just about mm-hmm. medicine. Mm-hmm. It could be something as simple as, uh, sitting with a few people that have just experienced a large amount of trauma, just so that they know that they have somebody with them that is creating a, a safer space or at least a, a buffer from what's going on around them. Um, especially if it's involving, um, we'll say over policing or militarized, uh, efforts of the state that actually hurt uh, local people far more uh, in situations of, of unrest and disaster. And so just trying to find a space where we're actually looking at for people on the ground as opposed to uh, relying on uh, state and government agencies uh, coming in to maybe do something, but oftentimes wait far too long uh, mm-hmm. while this stuff is still going on on the ground. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, well, thank you for that work. It's yeah. important. Well, for... The herbalism part of it, I mean, I've got my favorite little herbs, but I, I stay here. I don't jump on planes. I don't travel mm-hmm. very far. Mm-hmm. I'm boring. But <laughs> You've been all over the place. You have. Many I've... different climates, many different localities. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, uh, and I really envy folks who are in one place for many <laughs> reasons. Uh uh, in terms of that makes one of you. What, <laughs> in terms of what has to be done, it's just a different type of accommodation um, because I can only carry and transport so much uh, medicine, herbal medicine, whether tincture or dried, which a lot of times it's in tincture format. Um, and depending on the populations uh, being treated, uh, might go with something more like a, a glycerite as well or a vinegar because of issues of uh, substance abuse and yeah. Um, yeah. sort of dependency that goes along with that too. Uh, and just being sensitive to what people are desiring or needing. Um, and so, yeah, I do have a larger set of, of tinctures that some of which don't get used very often, but uh, just having those available as part of being as prepared as possible. Um, because oftentimes uh, I would get set up in a place where I can't necessarily run to the nearest 
herbalist store to buy <laughs> tinctures and I certainly can't make my own stuff on the on the ground there either um but uh yes what was the yeah that that is the and and so what do you do in those situations um in the cases where I need to actually find like new material or herbal yeah. material yeah. um well I guess uh there are a few that I've come to rely upon pretty heavily, um, which I don't know if there'll be five or more. I'm not going to keep okay. track right now, but uh, one that we were talking about earlier um, in particular, when we're talking about traumatic injuries of people, <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes that involves the blood on the inside of your body being on the outside of your body, which is not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. Um, so any type of cut or wound in that way, um, one of the herbs that I have found extremely useful as well as the people who've taught me, uh, is, is yarrow. Um, and that's something that, again, it grows from my experience, it grows in places that have already been somewhat disturbed by people in some way, but that's maybe not the rule, but I, I haven't found it as much in kind of, uh, old growth forests and, and deep woods as much as, um, near where people have been somewhat recently in the past few years to decades. Um, but, um, something that is also found pretty much everywhere that I've been uh, outside of maybe some high desert environments. I was going to say, um, desert is the only spot yeah. I'm not sure if Yarrow will thrive, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it does really well from, I believe, tropics all the way up through to almost the Arctic, if not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a nice, Jeez. versatile, yeah. Yeah. good one to know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And great and, wound healer. Totally. Yeah. Use it all the time. Great. So do you use it for internal and external? How do you typically, uh, depending on the situation? Depending course, on the yeah, but... situation. So um, especially uh, for something that is like an acute injury and blood is coming out, then yeah. uh, I've heard people say that, oh, just put some yarrow in the wound. It's like, yeah, but still following protocol to keep the blood from coming out of the body. So applying yeah. pressure. So all the things that you would normally do that would involve applying pressure to it, applying a proper dressing, trying to keep it cleaner if possible is also really helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then having the arrow there to assist that the coagulation process. So it's not, for me, I'm not one to say only use this method <laughs> if you're going to use herbs. It's like, no, it's definitely going to be a combination for the situation. And it's going to vary a little bit every single time you're dealing with either yourself getting cut or somebody else getting cut. Um, and this also applies to things, uh, that are less about accidental and could be more about, um, violence upon other people. So related to knife injuries or gunshot wounds as well, there's also other protocols to follow. But again, Yara would be one that if I, uh, didn't have any other ways of intervening in that, I would definitely go for that. And I have plenty of Yarrow that I travel with normally just in case I can't find something, uh, growing. Yeah, yarrow could be used as an internal tea too yep. to help mm -hmm. with the emotional wounding that mm -hmm. is associated with like most trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Draining your sinuses, yeah, getting mm -hmm. that crud out of your nose. That's mm -hmm. yeah. a fabulous thing. Totally. Yeah, well, that's a good one. What are the other ones that you like? Um, let's see. I think the, some of the others are cedar wood was one that you cedar, yeah cedar. You I mentioned about. not uh, could be medicine as well. Um. So a lot of the work that uh, we have done, both in training as well as in other areas, is is using uh, the, in this case, it was the eastern red cedar, uh, both for a source of creating fire, uh, not just using it to burn, but actually using uh, the wood itself to build a fire using a, a bow drill method of, of creating fire, uh, as well as... Um, using the bark itself. So once you pull some of the bark off, it becomes very, well, it's very fibrous anyway, but if you process it enough, uh, it becomes almost um, like fibrous cottony texture fluffy. that you fluffy. can, yeah, yeah, very fluffy. And you can actually use that uh, in a pinch to help uh, pack a wound. Nice. Um, and because there's also like, uh, I guess, terpenes, ter turpentine yeah. in particular, mm -hmm. uh, it also has a certain type of uh, like antiseptic Antifungal. effect, yeah. antifungal as well. Um, and uh, that can be used to kind of help stop the bleeding. And then eventually you'd want to clean that out and, and replace it as well. But that's with any type of dressing. But again, that's one that I've actually used myself um, for some hand and arm wounds that I got. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I have a scar, which is great. Um, and what was, what was else with the cedar that we talked about 
earlier. The fire for fire mm -hmm. and shelter as well. Fire and, oh yeah, the shelter, shelter. aspect of it. Thank yeah. you. And I mean, honestly, fire and shelter are medicine. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they very truly true. Very are true. Medicine. Very true. That's a yeah. much better contextualization of it. <laughs> um, and so, and that's just from, from one plant, one mm -hmm. from one tree. Um, and as, additionally, you could also be making uh, cordage from the bark as well. So different layers of the bark can be processed out so you can create different types of essentially rope. Right. Um, and what am I leaving out? And the sap itself, uh, if you process that down, if you can kind of boil it around, you can sort of make a pitch out of it as mm -hmm. well. So you can use it as a sort of an adhesive and a sealer. Uh, maybe not the same consistency as like a pine pitch, pine-based mm -hmm. pitch, but uh, you can definitely cook it into something that can help seal up a crack in other type of wood or a bowl. Um, I'm guessing that would be potentially good for a longer term treating a dermatitis style. Oh, potentially, or, yes. You yeah. know, where you've got that, because I mean, pine pinch has been used that mm -hmm, way. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to try that out with uh, with cedar based as yeah. well, just because I don't have direct experience doing it, right, but it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would try that myself at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What the heck? Mm -hmm. Not that I wish that kind of injury upon you. No. Because no. I certainly don't. No. <laughs> but if you do, run across that injury yourself and try it. I'll Let me it. know. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> what about for inflammation? Um, herbs for inflammation or for the cedar? In particular? Oh, oh, no, just for herbs in general for inflammation. Um, hmm, I think uh, one that you can find to some extent in the wild as well as on a, on a grocery shelf. Uh, blanking right now. Garlic alliums. Oh yeah, okay. in there's particular, a lot in that, in there's that. quite a few garlic, wild mm -hmm. garlics wild, and wild right. onions. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So that's one that is pretty consistently that I've been able to find. Again, everything changes yeah. once your elevation changes drastically, or the brittleness of the place. So the amount of moisture that can be held in the atmosphere mm -hmm. can, like in a desert environment, changes a lot. So. Um, yeah, in the yeah. wild, in the desert environment, I don't know if you'll find the garlic mm -hmm. so much, but you'll definitely find it at their, you know one-stop shops and the mm -hmm. gas stations totally it's, it's a nice easy it's one of those ones that's if you're in the urban wilds mm -hmm. without resources garlic is abundant and cheap yeah. at most types of grocery stores and like i said i mean you can you find that in turmeric and ginger yep those cinnamon. are the other yeah, yeah. Those are the other, <laughs> yeah. we discussed those earlier and <laughs> those basics. would all be considered top five slash top eight <laughs> or nine <laughs> or ten right now um but just because they are phenomenal and they're they're basically just food as well yeah. um so they're going to be more readily available even if you can't find them growing on the ground or under the ground rather in some cases yeah. one so. of the things that um in the little bit of emergency medicine that i've done is garlic is nice because people have confidence in it mm, so true. in a clinic setting you have confidence already because people are coming in and it's a it's a different setting mm -hmm. you're just yes. walking right. up to somebody you know yeah. they're they're you're patient compliancy and patient confidence in those items that they already have it at. Oh yeah. Garlic. Yeah. That, that yeah. fixes things. Mm -hmm. they, they get well, that. And a lot of us had grandparents who turned to garlic and onions to fix everything. And sure. horseradish. Sure. Right. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Horseradish, oh, it sure does drain them sinuses, that's for sure. But yeah. one of the things that brings up for me is the how. How do you recognize, what are the aspects of your environment that you that are wise to be looking at? Um, and I'm asking this from the perspective of someone who doesn't necessarily do the type of traveling that you do. You know, if you're saying, okay, I really should know a, a selection. I should have five or six herbs mm -hmm. that I know well enough that I could find them. Sure. What are the elements of your environment that are wise to be looking at? Urban, suburban. Mm, I how guess do when, you start to how do you start to how do that? like assessing the environment itself yeah. and kind of considering what could be growing there or uh, or specific what, things what that could might be, be either growing there or accessible for you. Let's say suddenly the zombie oh, apocalypse okay, really does yes. happen. Yes, yes, yes. How mm -hmm. do you figure that out? Okay, well, <laughs> how I, do we yeah, I understand the question more. I hope, and we'll see if it's what you're asking. Um, because we were earlier talking about uh, urban versus uh, either rural or wilderness related uh, survival and how in what is maybe considered an urban setting, there's already human-made infrastructure that exists, including things like grocery stores, mm -hmm. cooperatives, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, other people's pantries. <laughs> uh, depending on the situation, if there's been an evacuation, then 
maybe borrowing something from the neighbors is okay, uh, especially if it's medicine um, in that in that regard. Uh, so in those cases, finding uh, garlic, turmeric, ginger, uh, sage actually as well, which we didn't mm -hmm. talk about earlier, but a sage is another one that you can find even in in uh, fairly arid places too, yeah. um, are all super accessible medicine that people recognize and have confidence in. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the sage is like, I like one of the things I like about sage is you can find it in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. You can find it in the pantries and in, you know, like you said, grocery stores, that sort of thing. You can also find it in a lot of gardens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's, there's many different sages that grow in many different types of environments mm -hmm. year round, including yep. arid environments. Mm -hmm. um, so being familiar with sage and the sage of your own locality mm -hmm. seems mm -hmm. smart. Yeah, totally. You, know, you may not find turmeric. Like I'm not likely to find turmeric no. growing in anybody's backyard in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Although if I move down to Florida, it's conceivable. <laughs> sure, you know? sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that could also be um, like going back into like a grocery store environment too, where it's yeah. like you are very likely to find things, uh, root, root related things in particular, dried things that are not necessarily going to perish right away if all yes. the power goes out. Um, and just being aware of what is available from, from the people as well as potentially, uh, like in terms of, I think in Portland is one of the cities that has sort of a map of various and sundry, like fruit, like fruit and nut trees, uh, oh, as well. Nice. Yeah. And I hope I'm not making that up. It sounds, it sounds accurate. It sounds very Portlandia. But, I, could, uh, I could see that. But mm -hmm. in other cities too, tr people trying to actually map out the vegetation, kind of doing a bio blitz, yeah. uh, of their neighborhoods to say, oh, okay, here's a patch of mugwort growing here yeah. and to most folks that might not mean anything but in a pinch when you actually need to get medicine uh, on the fly mm -hmm. having that map set up so that you can actually understand yeah. if it's uh, in a neutral space or a city-owned space versus some neighbor that you may not get along with <laughs> right now <laughs> right. that may behoove you to not just for that purpose but again it's good yeah. to try and build a relationship with people right, uh, right. to have that accessible as well. The entire well, myth is... of Rapunzel was built on someone climbing the wall and getting <laughs> right? something out of it, wild crafting without permission. Yep. You right. do not do that. <laughs> no. Well, there's a lot of Chinese herbs in North America, at least, are considered ornamental garden plants. Oh, totally. You know, so mm -hmm. getting to know your neighborhood, neighbors, mm -hmm. your ornamental garden growers in your area might be useful as well absolutely mm -hmm. yep and so that's something that is both like a fun education practice too especially for things that most people might consider exotic even though it's like no this yeah. is what folks on the other side of the world use all the time every single day for their stuff but right. the context changes and then having a another type of respect for a much older tradition that yeah. uh has been finding more and more footholds over here too and people are actually in cases like we we're talking about um mountain gardens in uh, Western North Carolina where they're growing analogs for Chinese herbs yes. as well next yes. to traditional Chinese herbs. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I know that's also happening up in the Pacific Northwest, but I just don't have the same type of relationships with people to actually know who's doing Who's, who's doing, doing what, what and mm -hmm. how successful it is mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. this moment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So do you just, when you arrive in a new place, you kind of look around and do a scope of I see this growing here and that and mm -hmm. probably can predict yeah. other plants. Uh, for me, that I will admit is one of the places for, I guess, improvement in mm -hmm. my own practice because yeah. so often uh, I'll have uh, some sort of tincture or uh, tablet or ground herb of some sort that I can administer right away. And mm -hmm. so the need for me in the past to have to go kind of forage and wildcraft um, hasn't been as, as a necessity, but now I want to actually build that into my own personal practice that I can also offer to others as a skill. Um, so that's an ongoing thing. But um, in terms of doing that assessment of the land around you all the time, more so now than ever, um, basically because I've had a number of moments when I haven't had the materials I needed, and mm -hmm. that has prompted me to have, actually have to go off into the woods and find walk something. Around. Yeah, yeah, walk around. Yeah. And then oftentimes this is going to come back to how people can um, get more adept knowledge within mm -hmm. their own bioregions and their own neighborhoods and communities. Uh, finding someone who has more information because they live there and sort yeah. of understanding based on their guidance, uh, going on a plant walk with them, 
um, if they're willing, of course. <laughs> Don't follow those people around that are going and walking around in the woods. Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's creepy. Yeah. That's really creepy. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. Well, yeah. do what you want to, but just know that anyway, self-defense <laughs> is a thing. Um, but uh, like I was able to, I had the privilege of going on one of uh, Sue's plant walks just this past weekend. And so that is a practice that I've gotten into wherever I go. Um, so that's one of the things that I'll actually look up on a community bulletin board to see are there people walking around in the yes. desert looking at plants. Mm -hmm. Well, no, but who do I know that I could ask? Like, well, maybe yeah. somebody does this just because it's not a formalized thing. And so being able to go through that relationship route of uh, getting to know people in the community itself, because I don't try to look at that as being sort of an extractive educational process mm -hmm. because it could be like well i'm just using sue to find out what cool plants are out there and what i can break off trees and smell and sniff and <laughs> right. season my stew with <laughs> um and it's something that you get to know more about the person and their relationship with the world that they live in which is pretty profound it's yeah. i don't think people necessarily give that as much credit uh beyond the intellectual piece of memorizing plants which yeah. i find kind of boring if it's just memorizing plants it's like right. i could use a book and probably get the same thing but if it, the interaction the human interaction with the plants in the world yeah. it's profound it's yeah. it's something that i could probably just do all the time normally but i just don't have <laughs> don't have that luxury <laughs> uh, but at some point i would love to be able to offer that to others um as well um but for right now i'm definitely beholden to those who know far more and are willing to offer that type of knowledge. So what kind so. of things do you learn about when you're when you're going on a plant walk? Mm -hmm. Is it how Okay, do the do the talking now. I'm done with the talking. Oh, well, I was going to say well, see, you did uh did run one of the plant walks just I guess you walked one of the plant walks on Saturday, but um depending uh I'll try and think back to the last few that I've I've been on with folks, but uh some that uh, stood out particularly is also uh, like a land acknowledgement, mm -hmm. which uh, just sort of talks about how the land that we're walking around on or we will be walking around on uh, has been occupied, stewarded, um, enjoyed, preserved, protected by people that were here before uh, settlers came to colonize and are still in existence to this day, but may have been displaced through violent means. Um, and then understanding that that knowledge is persistent as well as their culture. And so that's, I put a lot of words in there, but ultimately just acknowledging where you are, not just yeah. the geography. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and on top of that, the geography and the climate is changing anyway. So if you want to acknowledge <laughs> that, that's also important because some yeah. of the plants that may grow there now may not be able to persist in the same way. Um, and so that's more of the justice meta-analysis that I appreciate mm -hmm. when it's there, but it's not always, and that's okay too. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then the focus of it can vary between, I've been on plant walks where somebody knows so much about every single plant that it's like, that's a plant, that's a plant, this is that and that, it's this, but they're not necessarily uh, specifically medicinally focused or ed edibility level focused or even poison toxicity focused. And that's kind of <laughs> dangerous too. So I do appreciate some degree of uh, consistency and like how is this something that is related to us in some way? Is it going to kill us or is it going to potentially help us feel better if we're feeling a certain illness or disease. Um, it's helpful to have the why. Why yeah, should I know this plant? Yeah, yeah. Why should, mm -hmm. I, why should I establish a relationship with this plant outside mm -hmm. of the fact that we all should have a relationship with all mm -hmm, the plants? Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, but, true, you true. You know, mm -hmm. can only fit so much in. <laughs> right. I think that's the, I, yeah, having the, the bandwidth and also the capacity initially to be able to take that in for somebody who is, Again, I'll just say that I'm humbly learning this stuff more so. And so somebody who's been doing it for years or like a botany student in particular, <laughs> um, it's overload yeah. uh, for me personally yeah. uh, to name every single plant and every variation of a single plant. It's like, right. but what do we do with these? We don't eat any of those because they're ferns and they're toxic. So, okay. Awesome. It's like, okay, great. All right. Well, I know that generally looks like a fern, so I'm not going to probably eat that. Okay, okay, great. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. But it takes a little time based on that connection with the person leading the walk in particular. Yeah. Uh, and others have various interests specifically in mycology and mushrooms, fungus, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is super awesome too. Uh, so just kind of knowing what you're going in for can be helpful because if you have no yeah. interest in that, then you may not get as much out of it. But uh, I'm, I'm more open to pretty much exploring what somebody's willing to share with me. Uh, unless I have a specific ask, it's like I want to know about the following types of things because I don't know where, I don't know how people in the desert 
would right. would use this type of medicine because I don't know what types of plants are. Anyway, right. so yeah. all sorts of things. If I'm not familiar, then I'll try and ask very specifically if they can help me out with that too. Well, and one of the things that you pick up, not always very directly, but at least I usually seem to absorb is whoever it is that's on the walk. You get pieces of the culture that's local, mm -hmm. which, you know, from a prepper perspective, that gives you an idea what type of cuisine or what type of approach do these people have? Because if suddenly there are zombies and I'm going to be raiding people's kitchens or gardens or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it gives me an idea of what I may or may not find in the area. Sure. Sure. You're a spooky chick. <laughs> <laughs> what? You don't think about these things? <laughs> no. No. No, I don't. Always you know what I think about. It's the same thing all the time. information. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Oh. Well, I guess we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll comment on that a little bit, but more uh, from the realm of, uh, of we'll say survival, but maybe not in the sense of like an end yeah. of the world type of survival scenario. So if we're talking about... Uh, times of collapse or disaster or yeah. recovery in those ways too. Um, it is easy. I think in, some of it might be our, our culture of individualism uh, to be focusing on how am I going to get out of this thing by myself mm -hmm. without any assistance from anyone, because that's how we're trained. We're trained to be isolated in many ways. Um, and how this can also, again, going on plant walks, understanding that there's mm -hmm. plenty to be learning from people cooperatively, both, potentially going on a plant, war, plant walk in a disaster situation because you need to, as opposed to here's some time where I can learn about it. But just understanding that relationship with people increases your survivability yes. considerably, uh, whether you identify as being a prepper or not, which I don't necessarily yeah. do that myself, but um, I, I don't really get behind just me being able to survive out there indefinitely by myself at all costs because right. it seems like a really... It seems like a hill to die on right there. <laughs> um, and so uh, some of these practices, I have to, both through the learning process as well as if I'm doing research through different literature, oftentimes it's set up as being like you're by yourself and that's it. Yeah, or yeah. anyone you meet, you're going to have to fight. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, but what if you have your whole village or family or community with you? Yeah, That doesn't, you know, you have other things you can do, amazing things you can do that you wouldn't be able to do by yourself. So... Let's talk about that next level in the mm -hmm. process because, right. you know, if you have many people to go out and gather awesome plants and herbs and medicines, you can definitely grow in different ways and thrive as opposed to just clinging on for dear life survival. Yeah. Right. So. Well, I think gathering as much information as you can about mm -hmm. whatever your community is, the people, the, the land, the area, it gives you knowledge to share, mm -hmm. which makes you more, makes you more valuable to the community that develops whatever that looks like. Sure, sure. And also lets you better take care of mm -hmm. those in the community and you can teach and share, which is a huge piece of recovery mm -hmm. when a disaster has happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a person that went on our plant walk and this is a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and he afterwards he said, you're the kind of person you know so much about these plants and edible plants and medicinal plants. I would definitely want to kidnap you and bring you to my land to help me survive. And I'm like, ha, 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 never speak to me again. But that, <laughs> if that was actually a scenario, that is a problematic view of the world. And to you're assume right. that the person you kidnap will be your helper, actually, in this case, my medicinal plants probably wouldn't be for helping it would be for me to get away from mm -hmm. the person. Yeah. True, you know foxglove really well. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's such an isolationist yeah. way to view the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it and it and it bodes you bodes you no good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly was a spooky thing to say. Never say that yeah. to a plant walk person. Kind of creepy. Listeners. Kind of creepy. Yeah. yeah. Also, just don't say that to anyone. <laughs> don't it's say just, it. It's yeah. probably a good and idea. perhaps if that thought yeah. comes up in your head, perhaps rethink it. Yeah. Consider yeah. seeking some help. Go get little help. therapy, perhaps. Yep. For sure. At least a priest, someone. Mm -hmm. But it is kind of an <laughs> indicative of some people's ideas of yeah. what will what what will I personally do? And yeah. we all have to expand our sense of I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. You know, why are we always thinking about eliminating our, the people around us mm -hmm. that can give us joy and, and assistance? Yeah. Why not just assume you're just part of that organism? The plants grow in communities. Why wouldn't why, we? Why sure. wouldn't we? Think we do. About it. Yeah. We absolutely do. Yeah. Yeah. 
people so can be boogers. if you're carrying a plant if you if you if you had to like take you had to limit your number of tinctures or mm-hmm. medicines what are the the ones the core group or a couple of the core group that you tend to want to carry everywhere wherever you go obviously yarrow, yarrow is still going to be right mm-hmm. up there yeah. um one that we didn't talk about uh something uh, like peppermint of some sort um mint. some mentholated mint in particular both yeah. for the kind of calming sense of many of these two also edibility um and then the general cooling factor that's yes. inherent with many of them um uh, peppermint or spearmint this mints mm-hmm. are really great when you have digestive upset totally. which you know totally happens mm-hmm. when something traumatic has happened mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. can make it hard to eat for some people their stomachs go way off and they just have no mm-hmm. appetite sure because they're you under know. stress yep. yeah mm-hmm. so the mints help to stimulate proper appetite mm-hmm. but it also helps to settle the upset stomach that mm-hmm. happens when You've got too much emotion to process and your stomach's just mm-hmm. roiling. Or you're eating too much food that came out of a bucket that you bought yeah. at Costco 14 years ago. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> anyone who would do that. Yikes. Yeah. Um, Seems wrong. <laughs> um, well, that makes me think, too, of uh, also sage as well in terms of the, yeah. the digest- digestive uh, effects as well and just it being readily available um and that's something that i don't know if i even really necessarily need to carry it around because it that's is there. all over the place but still having that preparation in mind um, having a, a bundle that you either are using for medicine or if you uh do things related to ceremony or ritual as well it's yeah. also something that um has a definite psychological uh mm-hmm. spiritual impact um that can also be yeah, cedar survival wood. for people cedar too. was another cedar, good one cedar. for that yep. same oh yeah same we didn't purpose. say that earlier yeah. yes yes yeah. yes mm-hmm. very aromatic resinous um and do you have fa- favorite antibiotics that you like antibiotic um, is an evil word it's it's a real thing i know but you know what that word breaks down to anti life biotic is like life okay well you so. do you but it is also <laughs> oregon grape Mm-hmm. I know, you know, but I like to think bacteria. It's I like to bacterial. I like to think of them as perhaps antiseptics or antibacterial, antiviral, antifungus. Okay, just because I think antibiotic is one of those words that's been created by the pharmaceutical industry that's really all about killing everything, and that's what antibiotic drugs do. Whereas Oregon grape just kills the bad it's stuff. Selective, yeah, yeah. It's selective, and I like the selective nature of plants. Okay, and what kind of anti? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, what kind of germ killer? I don't know. Uh, echinacea, lavender, echinacea. chamomile, things of that nature too. Um, oh yeah, I love lavender. Mm-hmm. I have a weird relationship with echinacea. Yeah. Yeah. It's how, not how a, weird. It, and I am not on speaking terms all the time. Oh, some days it it laughs at you and says, "No, not going to do it." No, I just, just I just think there's so many other herbs that are better than it. Mm-hmm. But I think I might not be using it very well. I mean, if somebody gets a spider bite or something, yeah, stick some echinacea in it. Sure, that's that's great. But other stuff, I just I perhaps don't really know how to use it properly. How do you? Mm, use it? Interesting. Um, I guess for echinacea, usually more of a like a preventative as opposed to being like a treatment for something like an illness at the time. But that's just out of recommended practice so mm. and i don't really use it that often though like mm-hmm. itself um but uh yeah lavender and chamomile for any number of different things oh, chamomile's yeah. fabulous yeah. and poorly used yeah mm-hmm. not used yeah. enough yeah and yeah, yeah true true yeah like oh it'll make you sleepy there are so many more things that we'll yeah that's yeah. the big one yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's definitely just which is why it's all over the place but as far as antifungal medicine, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. fabulous. Mm-hmm. Great for styes in the eye and all sorts mm-hmm. of stuff, too, that people yep. wouldn't think of. Make a good tea bag it's a good out of that. It's antibacterial. It yes, it is an antibacterial. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good for your stomach, too. Yes, it it's is actually very good really for your stomach. Really good for, yeah. And mm-hmm. it's good for when you're dealing with people who have really sensitive stomachs, like people who have dealt with like SIBO and Crohn's and, you know, the stuff where their digestive system yeah. just in normal life mm-hmm. gets messed up real easily. Mm-hmm. And now they're dealing with trauma. Chamomile is a good, gentle, but powerful herb for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pineapple weed is um, that's something you see. In, yeah. And that's mm-hmm. that's another matricaria. It's the same genus as chamomile. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Same properties. Mm-hmm. That's all over. But don't, don't like, be careful where you harvest things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
pulling that out of your driveway. And he sprayed things. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's one thing, too, that came up with uh, – well, we were talking about in the clinic a lot about foot soaks, but uh, for places where – Maybe they only have certain like if chamomile is growing, like doing an antifungal foot soak mixed with other things could be sage as well. Um, mm -hmm. Has also been something that, uh, again, in more like a flooded disaster area type of thing where mm -hmm. feet are constantly threatened and mm -hmm. life threatening potentially foot. too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, anything that can help offset some of that is great. Um, and so that was yeah. one that uh, came up. It was what two years ago or so, and so that was one that was recommended, and it did really well. Um, I think if there were some other herbs available, it would have increased it as well. But just mm -hmm. having a chamomile soak was surprisingly effective because I just hadn't ever applied it that way before. But that's what we had. It makes mm -hmm. sense. So. I mean, it's warming and drying, mm -hmm. and your mm -hmm. feet are your roots, so mm -hmm. yeah. it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep, and there's a uh, foot issues. Oh yeah, you break my heart. Oh. I really do. Well, that's a heck of a list. <laughs> it's going to be fun to write into the show notes. <laughs> Let's see. Anything else that's just got to be on oh, here. Oh, um, gosh. We left out uh, uh, Mullen. Mullen. Oh, yeah. Mullen, especially if we're talking about some of the – oh, and OSHA. OSHA root, too. Just things related to some of the respiratory – uh, issues, especially yeah. with the contaminated air in particular, mm -hmm. um, ongoing contamination of air. Like that, fires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just uh, the quality of evaporating or mixing chemicals in places that normally aren't okay. flooded. That's something that. Yeah. Oh, that's a good yeah, point. toxic exposure as well. Mm -hmm. So part of it is just you need to get out of there. But if you can't get out of there, what can you do to make sure that you can survive? that yeah. process too so mm -hmm. yeah. and and I, I don't have yeah mullen's good for stress induced asthma and mm -hmm. asthma in general so i'm guessing that would be something that would really kick up mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. those kinds of areas totally and also grows in places that are disturbed by humans a lot so <laughs> mm, that's for sure um, yeah you use the whole plant of of mullen oh she's mm -hmm. a little more difficult to find definitely sometimes. more sp more specific yeah. too um and then also for mullen uh one thing that we were able to do, some of us were able to do, I was not able to in this case, but uh, the stock itself of mm. last year's plant uh, can be used to make fire as oh, well using a, what's called a, like a hand drill method, nice, um, huh. which is pretty neat. So anyway, yeah, another conversation, gonna... <laughs> something to research, something to ask We're going to be going out looking for our mullen stocks, right, Sue? Yeah. Oh, you don't have to look very far. <laughs> no. Yeah. I've heard about people soaking those stocks and then they catch it on fire like little torches. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They yeah. burn. They burn well sense. once they catch. But in this case, we'd be actually using that on another piece of wood to create an ember or coal yeah. and using that to blow it into a fire. We've got a little bit of that cedar, nice little piece of cedar plank, and yep. then some fluffed up cedar bark, and then or the cat, mullen. cat tail fluff. Yeah, he's got the yeah. fluff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Huh. Totally. Well, I'll be darned. Okay. Yep. Fire medicine. Uh, you are an interesting dude. <laughs> and you are causing me to show note out here. This list is out of control. Yep. You can take some of that out too. I will it's not. All good. No, it's okay. all good. Okay. I, I love it. It's fun. <laughs> I think the key. I think the key is really to understand the type of environment you're in. I mean, if you're dealing with an environment that tends to be more damp, then drying herbs are good to know. Totally. Mm -hmm. Antifungal herbs, really yes. good to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. If your environment's really, really dry, you know, you're probably going to want to know things like the plantain and the marshmallow yep. and moistening, you know, herbs moistening as well. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. be here you now. Know. That's the thing you got to say. Yeah. A lot of yeah. lot more cacti related succulent allies as well in those places for for yeah. water. So, yeah, yeah, that's really important yeah. to the desert. Very, very important. <laughs> Fire, not as it is Plus, a concern, but you can generate that a little quicker than. Well, and you'll probably make places. it through the night in the desert. Mm -hmm. You'll probably be okay, and then the daytime should be warm, unless it's the really high desert, mm -hmm. in which case, oh goodness, maybe give up. No, no, <laughs> maybe give up. up. <laughs> never, never, <laughs> give, never give up, y'all. Keep, keep going, keep fighting. <laughs> Keep Don't give up. One. Never give up. Not the day. Never this is not the day. <laughs> wow. Do you have places that you like links or or websites that you look to for um you know good herbs to use in areas or do you have go tos? Hmm. I might be blindsiding you on this a, one. a little <laughs> bit, but it's just because I don't necessarily keep a list going. But uh one that was mentioned earlier is uh Mountain Gardens in Western North Carolina, mm -hmm. um, where again, among other things, it's just also a wealth of, of accumulated like, legacy generational knowledge. Um, but they also grow analogs for uh, traditional Chinese herbs. Um, and 
it's built into the side of an amazing mountain. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that's a place that when I get over there, I try and stop by and see if they're offering different classes or instructions. And sometimes it's just nice to sit with um, Joe Hollis if he's available too. Um, and um, and you were saying just yeah. go on plant walks. Go on plant walks. Yep. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, I think uh, I'm blanking right now. Uh, yeah, places uh, up in like Minnesota, which is oh, yeah. where y'all were talking about. One of the last plant walks I was able to go on before going to the Wilderness Immersion Program was up there in, uh, in Rochester, actually. Nice. And that was through a, yeah. a local uh, like park conservancy program. Um, yeah. And so they just do a very regular plant walk through their trail system there. Um, and the person who's running it, uh, the person, the people that are involved with the actual plant walk make a huge difference and super enthusiastic. Yeah. It wasn't like, here I go naming these plants that I name all the time. <laughs> it, it was definitely a new plant, even though they may have seen it many times before. That was last week. Yeah. So this plant's different now. Yeah. This plant is a new plant. Um, and that ongoing wonderment factor is really, it's important for me. It for other people, it may not matter. But I, right. I appreciate the enthusiasm and the openness about that type of, I don't know, fascination, ongoing fascination too. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's another place that is, I think it's, I put it in the show notes, but um, it's in its in Oregon, uh, closer to Portland, um, called Alohe Farms. Uh, they also grow various forms of uh, like native seeds and um, nice. part of their, so it's uh, Randy and Edith Woodley are the, the owners. Uh, it's also, uh, again, indigenous uh, led and maintained project. And it's also connected to uh, ongoing um, kind of restoration of culture mm, uh, nice. as well as um, kind of providing an educational space and environment. So it's both like a, it's so many different things. And I was able to visit they're earlier this season um, and they are trying to do all sorts of different things because of incidences that have happened to them as people that is requiring them to consider um, a different type of expansion. So a resurrection uh, of their project. So and that's a place that they're still offering tours and whatnot as well. And I'm just hoping that they can continue to get support. Um, and that's a place where you, Part of the plant walk is just going around to seeing what's been growing in their areas because they don't consider it necessarily organic or permaculture or any of these things because this is just how things have been grown for many, many thousands of years. (laughs) And the labels don't matter much to us because we're just going to be continuing on with these practices. And so seeing it that way, too, it puts it into a different context of what is wild and what is not and what is human and, you know, where those things actually intersect all the time if we let them. Yeah. So, but yeah, Aloha Farms, um, definitely check them out, um, support them, donate to their fundraiser. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you very much for sharing all this stuff with us. And uh, I know you have a variety of um, causes that you're working on and supporting, and I'll make sure I have that mm-hmm. sure. in your in your show notes. That's great. Um, and I also I know you have a an email that if people have questions, yes, people can contact you at. Sure, yeah, and that one for our purposes here is uh, Jim Sang. It's like Jin Sang, but J I M S E N G, like my name Jimmy. Uh, so it's Jim Sang at riseup.net. Nice. Okay, and again, folks, this is all in the show notes, and we appreciate you listening to us. And I hope that you enjoyed this as much as I sure did. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you for being Thank with us. Thanks for your Thank ongoing you, work. Thanks for having me, all Yeah. And as always, put, put an herb, herb on, on it. it. The statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with a healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials questions or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.